the Coalition for Peace uh, Action. And I want to thank you for joining this uh, very timely and important webinar. Uh, and we are so uh, honored and uh, blessed to have Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson as our speaker this afternoon. He uh, is a adjunct professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary and the former chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. He is a critic of US foreign policy surrounding the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, Iran and the new Cold Wars with China and Russia and asserts that the US is not a democracy, but a war state that forces its will on the global community. In 2020, Wilkerson worked on bipartisan projects to prepare for the possibility that a defeated Donald Trump would refuse to leave office. And let me say in a more personal note, uh, Colonel Wilkerson uh, spoke for our annual membership dinner in 2017, gave a superb uh, talk at that, but he also in that same time frame uh, was part of some videos that we made uh, for the Interfaith Network on Drone Warfare. And Colonel Wilkerson was very cogent and powerful on those as well. And so we are deeply, deeply honored and pleased at this time when many of us are very concerned about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and the whole region to have Colonel Wilkerson. The title of his talk today is Why All the Fuss About NATO, the Ukraine-Russia Crisis and Other Regional Issues. Colonel Wilkerson. Well, thank you, Reverend Moore. And thank you for having me back. You're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> um, one can't talk about this issue or these issues without really going back to the administration that I kind of got my feet wet in, H.W. Bush's administration, uh, into the Cold War, halcyon times as I look back on, uh, right before General Powell died, we were remarking in an email with one another about how things had gone astray, just simply gone astray from 9-11 on, but really they started before that. And I think we would both agree that they started around 1994. Now, let me back up just a little bit and say that the euphoria and the, uh, in, in Powell's case, he was going to Vienna as the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and lecturing the Warsaw Pact, former Warsaw Pact generals on how to survive in a democracy. And it was, it was quite interesting when he would come back and debrief us and tell, tell us about some of the questions he got. He made a comment, for example, in one of the briefings um, to the generals assembled that he served in a country that didn't like him. And they were puzzled over that. And he explained to them our, our, a little bit of our history that the military had not always been a worshiped institution in the United States. In fact, it was a very feared institution. And there were even people like Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts who suggested that the Constitution Constitutional Convention when they were discussing under the president of the convention's watchful but silent eye, George Washington, how many troops they might maintain. And uh, it, you know, Gary didn't want to maintain any, but he asked in a fairly audible voice, uh, wow, at least we ought to uh, maybe limit it to 2,000. And Washington is supposed to have been a stage whisper, which was one of Washington's favorite techniques. Uh, mumble, well, if our enemies would just do the same, we could do that. But we have never had an affection for the military. In fact, this, this affection for the military today, including thank you for your service, which incidentally, military veterans do not like, most of them, they do not like it. They will nod their head and say thank you, but they really don't like it. What they really don't like is the fact that you're getting out of service and getting uh, your licks in by telling them thank you for their service, when they've done four tours overseas, maybe they've got post-traumatic stress and so forth. Um, it, it's a bad situation. It really is a bad situation. And it's being reflected now, actually in the polls dropping. The military as an institution has dropped in the polls for the past six months. Probably Afghanistan had something to do with that. Probably 20 years of unwon wars had something to do with that. But some 
aspect of it is this gap that's developing between civilians and the military. Um, scholars call it the civil military gap, and it, it is getting wide. That's a dangerous development too. But at this time, Powell was trying to tell these Warsaw Pact generals who had served in the Soviet armed forces, um, either as an ancillary or as an actual Russian component thereof, that it was a healthy thing to keep a distance between the uh, uh, love, affection one might have for one's military and the actual event that takes place with that military, war. It's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and our founders knew that uh, in, inside out because they all they did was look back at Europe and see the princes and the kings and the wars that are, were occurring there. And of course, that was a lot of what went into their crafting of the Constitution. Well, we've come a long, a long way from that. But here we were in 1992, 1993, with the Cold War over, Powell and Bush did not want to be triumphant. They did not want to beat Mikhail Gorbachev into the ground. They didn't want to say, oh, man, we beat you. There were people like that, though. Believe me, there were people we're now seeing a raid around Donald Trump and elsewhere in the Republican Party who wanted to beat Gorbachev to death. They wanted to triumph, put track shoes on and walk on the Soviets. Um, George H.W. Bush didn't want to do that. He was very humble about it at first. He got a little bit recalcitrant himself toward the end of his tour. But here we are in this period when we are saying, okay, Russia, you can be an observer to both the political and the military alliance called NATO, and eventually you could be a member. So let's work towards that. And Gorbachev went along with it. His foreign minister, Shepard Nazi, Edward Shepard Nazi went along with it. And Yeltsin, when he replaced him, went along with that. Things were looking pretty good. Then let's come up to 1994 when William Jefferson Clinton needs to get reelected and is not exactly sure he's going to get reelected. What does he do with his foreign policy? He suddenly becomes a very ardent campaigner and advocate for NATO expansion. Well, what had been a very careful process up to then, that is to say, we would do something, we would ask them if they approved. They would do something, they would ask us if we approved. And we would go slowly along looking at what might be possible with an eye on Russia and they with an eye on us the whole time. That's when we went back to the Open Skies Treaty, uh, which Eisenhower had originally uh, wanted to do in the very beginning of the Cold War, where we could fly over each other's countries and so forth and look and make sure what we were doing and make sure we weren't lying to one another. So this, th this changed gradually as Bill Clinton decided that his policy thereafter was going to be a very vigorous NATO expansion program. And let's fast forward to today and let me ask you a fundamental question, which I asked in a German interview yesterday with Berlin, a, a group in Berlin. Um, they, were, they were actually, I, I think it's fair to say they were sort of thunderstruck when I posed the question to them because they hadn't even thought of it. And I did in an interview with uh, Australians uh, that night, um, the individual in Perth, Australia, who was interviewing me, uh, asked some really good questions, and it came up, and I, I gave it to him. How do you deal with the most important and the most unique component of NATO if you're going to expand like this? And if you know anything about NATO, you know precisely what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Article 5. There are not many treaties, in fact, I'm, I can't think of any in history that have been as successful politically and militarily as NATO for as long a time and had an Article 5-like component. In fact, there aren't very many with an Article 5-like component. What is Article 5? An attack on one is an attack on all. Think about that for a moment, as I said to Berlin's audience. Think about that. That means that the person in Peoria the person in the desert towns in Nevada, wherever they might be in America, is willing to risk nuclear war over Lithuania, over Latvia, over Estonia, over Ukraine, if we were to go that far. They don't even know where they are on a map. And when you start telling the American people that they are going to risk nuclear war over these 29, 30 countries we now have in NATO, not counting us, 29, 
I don't think too many of them are going to be cooperative. And let's look at what else we've done with Article 5. We've put NATO in Afghanistan. We put NATO in Iraq. We let NATO lead the military operations in Libya, which were a disaster, or still a disaster. How does Article 5 apply to that? So the most important component of the NATO alliance has been completely ignored, and I've not seen this in a single media source in America. I've seen it in a couple of foreign press articles, but not in America. No one's talking about it because they don't know what to do with it if they know anything about it in the first place. That's a real conundrum with regard to why would you want to do this? Why would you want to spread that kind of commitment, which is ultimately in its most profound form, the willingness to risk nuclear war? Because both of us are still the most heavily equipped with nuclear weapons states on the face of the earth, Russia and us. Together, we had 60,000 weapons at the end of the Cold War. We're down to about 10,000 now combined, but that's still enough to obliterate us all. It's enough to put nuclear winter across this planet for five years and we wouldn't be able to raise crops, we'd be through. And I don't know a sensible person in or out of the military who doesn't understand that if you go nuclear, you go all the way. There's no way you're gonna control escalation if you start it. And that's what we're talking about again now too, based on this confrontation over Ukraine. Russian military doctrine now includes battlefield, battlefield use of small yield nuclear weapons. This hasn't occurred since the early 50s when there were military people in both the Soviet Union and in the United States who believed they had utility. Um, most Americans don't realize that Dwight Eisenhower in the late 50s was actually talking to his military about using nuclear weapons against Mao Zedong when he was on the islands of Komoi Matsu shelling them daily and looking like he was going to go on to Taiwan. And one of the generals in one of the confabs that Eisenhower had with him, um, interesting dialogue because they knew he was a former army general. They knew who he was, and, and he knew they knew who he was. So it wasn't like talking to Bill Clinton or talking to Barack Obama or even talking to George W. Bush. It, it just wasn't the same thing. They knew they were talking to the premier military man in the United States of America. And so one of the generals, when uh, a group of the uh, Joint Chiefs had suggested using nuclear weapons against Mao, the general said, and what do you think Moscow will do? And Eisenhower said, I, I'd like to hear the answer you have to that. And no one wanted to answer the question. So they went on in dialogue for a few minutes and then the general hadn't gotten an answer to his question. So he came back to it. He said, what are they gonna do if we do what you're saying we should do, use nuclear weapons, what is Moscow gonna do? And there wasn't any answer to that question. And I can almost guarantee you what Eisenhower was thinking. There's no way we're gonna do that. There's absolutely no way we're gonna do that. Well, we're back there today. With, with, with all that knowledge in the past and everyone having forgotten it, except people like me that teach it. <laughs> We're back there with Putin and his general. The, the Russians have actually incorporated into their written military doctrine that if they have an incursion, and the only way they're going to have an incursion, and you read their doctrine, you know who they're talking about, is NATO. If they have an incursion into their near abroad or their territory, they are going to hit the points and the flanks of that incursion with nuclear weapons. You can't have it any more explicit than that. And of course, now we're talking about a new nuclear weapons development program, which I hope the nuclear posture review that President Biden is doing right now will kill. I can't tell you what'll happen in 2024 when we get a new president, but that doctrine was going to include our response, more tactical nuclear weapons, and we were gonna put them on submarines, ballistic missile submarines, and counter the Russian nuclear weapons with those. Now, let me ask you, even as a layman, and I'm not a nuclear weapons expert, I was a prefix five officer, a nuclear officer, but I'm not an expert in them in the sense that some of these people are, but how do you differentiate if you're a Russian looking at a nuclear ballistic missile nuclear submarine opening its doors and getting ready to launch and launching, that's when you're gonna pick it up for sure. How do you differentiate between a strategic launch and a tactical launch, you can't. 
So what do you do? You, you have a few minutes to react. It's pretty clear what you do. You react and you react with a strategic launch of your own. This is very dangerous to what we're doing. How does that apply to Ukraine? Fast forward for a moment. As we began to expand NATO and, and Putin in particular, but his military in general, began to get really, really worried about how close we were coming to their borders and, and what is comfortably their territory. I mean, Ukraine was a part of Russia since Catherine the Great. Um, it got to be really serious in terms of Putin's language with us. And when we suggested, my president went to Georgia, he went to Tbilisi, Georgia, and suggested publicly with the Georgian president right beside him that Georgia would someday be a member of NATO. Well, we saw what Putin did there. Now he has about 25% of Georgia, he invaded it. Um, and, and now we're talking about Ukraine, which is even more serious than Georgia, really, if you look at a map. And here's what I think we have discovered. I think we knew it quite long, but uh, we now have suddenly discovered it for negotiating purposes. He really was concerned about. We are putting ballistic missile defense launchers all over Europe. And we're touting that they are for just that ballistic missile defense. And usually we will say that they're for Iran. You know, we're for Iran. You know, they're not for you, Mr. Putin. They're for Iran in case Iran were to shoot a, a missile or North Korea for that matter, who's gaining range and range capacity every day. That's what we say publicly. Well, Mr. Putin, have some empathy, Mr. US president, have some empathy. Mr. Putin looks at that within eight minutes flight time of Moscow and says, well, those are not necessarily ballistic missile defense launch platforms because I know what they're dual capable of. And he's absolutely right. They're capable of launching Tomahawk cruise missiles with a nuclear warhead on them, which we have. And so he's looking at maybe eight to 10 seconds flight time <laughs> before it gets into his bailiwick big time. And nuclear weapons in your bailiwick are not comfortable. Um, so it, compare it, if you will, to Khrushchev's attempt in 1962 to put missiles in Cuba and the change in strategic flight time for those missiles. I mean, you're talking about some really short ranges to hit some fairly big targets in the United States. And no one wanted to talk about a Yankee submarine, Soviet submarine sitting off Boston. You know, flight time into Washington from a Yankee submarine was about... 18 seconds or something like that, sort of like a 9-11 situation. I'd look out my window at the State Department, and it was about 11-second flight time from National Airport to my window. Uh, that was kind of worrisome after 9-11. Uh, so that's what got Putin really energized and started moving these troops and so forth. What I think we're doing now, and this gives me some hope, is I think Blinken and Sullivan in particular, but Tony Blinken in, 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 in specific with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian counterpart, foreign minister for Russia, I think they are now talking in ways that go something like this. Would you be satisfied if we agreed that for an indeterminate period, we won't put any BMD launchers in Ukraine? And maybe we might, talk with you a little bit about the ones we've already put down in Poland, for example. Um, that would probably get to the point where you could come to a deal. And then you go back to the Minsk agreement, which Putin has been asking to do all along. And you have provisions in the Minsk agreement that I would bring forward and adapt and, and make real um, that would give you more or less a what I call a studied neutrality. That is to say, Ukraine would be a neutral country. No one would covet it as a possessed, uh, you know, as a violation of their sovereignty, their state sovereignty. Um, what could you do during that neutrality? You could do all the things you need to do. Neutra uh, Ukraine has one of the most corrupt governments on the face of the earth. They, they cannot seem to get their act together with any political group or party. Um, they need some time to figure out how to get rid of the old communists, they're still around, to get rid of the neo-Nazis, whom we are backing with our CIA, which is appalling. You know, you can't find anybody to back that believes the same thing you do. Uh, who, who really hates the Russians? Oh, these neo-Nazis. Oh, wonderful. Let's back them. 
that's the kind of thing we do in the world now and don't tell the American people anything about it. Um, but they would have this time, this time of neutrality to get their act together politically, governmentally, um, corruption wise, economically, financially. Um, and maybe if the EU, Moscow and Washington primarily, but everyone really, Beijing too, just did nothing but help them with that as much as they can whether it's financial help, economic help, advice and counsel, whatever, uh, observers for their elections, those sorts of things, that would be a positive development, I think. And quit talking about being a member of anybody's alliance. Quit talking about all things military. Quit sending weapons in. I applauded the Germans on that broadcast that I did. I applauded them for saying, we're not sending weapons. And no one's transmitting weapons through our territory. To um, smart. The Germans are smart. Um, so that's a solution that I see, and I hope we stumbled on it, and I hope that's what we're doing right now. That's what I'm hearing from my sources inside the Pentagon and the State Department, um, that we, we are finally beginning to talk realistically. My concern, deep concern, is that, and even the president, President Biden, has demonstrated this over the last six or seven weeks from time to time. The, the need to talk belligerently and principally because of politics, domestic politics, uh, because somebody like Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or Lindsey Graham is going to jump up and accuse the president of being Neville Chamberlain, you know, and you know, abandoning Czechoslovakia to the Nazis and all these other historical analogies that have no relevance whatsoever to today. I wish they'd put them all away. They're all irrelevant to today's circumstances. And to take counsel from those past events is to take counsel from nonsense. And yet that's what the press does all the time. They'll talk about Munich. They'll talk about, you know, what did Neville Chamberlain do? We can't be a Neville Chamberlain. Well, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie Munich on the Edge of War, but they finally are telling the truth about that. Neville Chamberlain bought time for Britain to rearm for the war that he knew Winston Churchill would fight. He sacrificed his prime ministership. He sacrificed his government. He sacrificed, indeed, his name to get that time. Now, he sacrificed Czechoslovakia, too. And people would say, well, that was terrible. But there are things you have to make decisions like that when you're at that level of power. and Someone like Hitler is threatening you. At any rate, they aren't relevant to today. Appeasement's not relative to today. What's relative today is that there are 750 million Europeans now who can't seem to get their act together politically, um, maybe not even economically anymore. Look at Brexit and Britain. Um, those 750 million people constitute, along with China, ourselves, India, and maybe some other possible uh, condominium-like organizations in the world, the real power in the world today. Certainly the poles of that power are China and, and America. Russia is a capital with a gas station. If you really look at what Russia has in terms of cards in its hands, they're very slim. In fact, Putin is a master craftsman the way he's done what he's done and gotten the publicity he's gotten and kept himself in office through that publicity um, because he really doesn't have a whole lot of power other than nuclear weapons. Uh, people say, well, you know, 200,000 Russian soldiers. Well, okay. I'll go back to my comments with the Reverend before we started. We put 165,000 troops in Iraq and we got our rear ends handed to us. <laughs> I mean, we did. We did the same thing in Afghanistan, not quite as many troops, but we had to retreat with our tail between our legs. So it doesn't, number of troops doesn't mean anything anymore, especially when you've got people who are willing to wage guerrilla warfare against you until they die and their children die. You, you can't win those kind of wars and anyone getting involved in them is just colossally stupid. That's the best way to put it. And I don't think Putin is stupid. I really don't. Um, I hope he doesn't prove to me that I'm wrong and do something that would be colossally stupid like invade Ukraine. Um, and things like that have happened in the past. I go back to 1911, 12, 13, and 14 and look at none of the capitals wanted war then all of a sudden, a couple of them did, and then things sort of coalesce. The Archduke Ferdinand gets assassinated, and people start their mobilization tables and before you can stop. You've got the bloodiest war in human history to that point, World War I. 
So I, I never discount the possibility of human error and accident and fate. But I think we're at a point right now where diplomacy could prevail and we could back down from the sort of edges we're all on right now. And I would see, as I said before, I would see, and, and I would do this if I were President Biden, I would see the Germans being able to play a sort of middleman in all of this to be very effective. Uh, normally, I might say the French, but the French have been kind of uh, here and there on this up to this point. The Germans have been very solid, very solid. And my experience with the Germans when we were doing the real feat of the late 20th century, and I mean that, George H.W. Bush created an absolute miracle along with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze when they brought Germany back together peacefully and kept it in NATO and kept Moscow mollified. That was an incredible feat that neither Gorbachev nor Bush, Shevardnadze, Baker, Bush's Secretary of State, and so we get enough credit for. It was incredible. It was almost without a peep. <laughs> I remember Helmut Kohl saying from Germany, of course, at the time, Helmut Kohl saying, we've just done a, a small miracle. And no one's really screaming in the headlines about it. <laughs> and yet it was. Uh, NATO's purpose for a soldier like me, the way we summed it up before the Cold War ended was to keep Russia out, the Germans down, and the Americans in. That was it. That was the summary of our purpose in NATO. Um, think about that for a minute now. <laughs> why does NATO even exist now? Why, why do we need it now? Well, I think probably we need it for a few more years just to keep the transatlantic link from severing. Uh, I'll, I'll take you back to 1989 when I first joined Colin Powell in Atlanta at US Forces Command. And I'm a fresh caught lieutenant colonel, and he's a fresh new, he's the youngest four star general in the Army. Um, he's just come from being national security advisor, the sixth one to Ronald Reagan. And we're musing about Europe. And he had just, right before that, he'd been Fifth Corps commander in Frankfurt. So he sat on the Fulda Gap where the Russians would flow through for World War III to start. So he knew a little bit about Europe. And we're talking about it, and he looks at me and he says, you know, all the leaders in Europe in a few years will not have their feet in the war. Now, I knew what he meant. Helmut Kohl, Francois Mitterrand, Thatcher, Major, they'd all be gone. And he said, when that happens, when we get a crop of leaders in Europe, and then, of course, you know, every leader after that will be the same, that don't remember the war, that don't have a memory, either as a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, 20-year-old, whatever, of that war and what America did for Europe in that. Forget the transatlantic link. It will sever, tatter, break, and it'll be over. Well, that's Putin's number one objective right now. That's his number one strategic objective, is to separate the United States from Europe. Then to kill NATO, and separating the United States will do that, so he gets two for one in that. And then third, to make sure the European Union, 750 million people now, doesn't get its act together and become a competitor. That's Putin's, those are Putin's strategic goals. I, I, I just know those are his strategic goals. I, that's what I was trained as, a strategist. And he is a strategist, par excellence. He's one of the best strategists in the world. And he's also got one of the finest foreign ministers in the world, Sergei Lavrov. Powell and he were like that on the cell phone every day, talking, resolving things. That, you know, the NSA said, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's classified information. Yeah, Powell and uh, the Chinese foreign minister talked on cell phones, too. Their objective was to stop the crisis before it happened, to get in there and talk, because talking was better than going to war. And they, cell phones expedited that. And so to heck with the NSA. They, they talked. Um, you may remember the April 10th crisis when the Chinese shot down a U.S. reconnaissance plane that strayed too close to Hunan Island. And our plane had to go down on Hunan Island, and the Chinese captured it. Powell was on the cell phone immediately with Chen Chichen, who was the Chinese man traveling with the Chinese leadership group at that time in South America, and who knew America better than anyone else. And before Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney could start a war, Powell had solved the crisis. I mean, that's how, that's how diplomacy is done today, by good people working fast. 
Uh, I'm sad to say we've kind of lost that skill. Uh, we need to get it back. We need to better get it back quickly. And this is a crisis that I think could do that, it could grow us up a little bit. Um, some other things about it, though, that, that are less than savory. <laughs> One is the fact that we don't know where to go from here with NATO. Um, we, we don't want to back down in the sense that we lose, lose faith. That's just an American trait. Uh, but at the same time, I think we're beginning to understand, and I'm almost positive President Biden understands this. I'm, he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, when Dick Luger was in the chair, when the Republicans had the majority, Powell still talked to Biden. Um, the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, asked him one time why he didn't talk to Luger. Luger was in his own party. Why didn't he talk to Luger? And Powell just said, frankly, Biden knows the issues. <laughs> and, and insinuating that Luger didn't. <laughs> and so he would talk to Biden all the time. So I know Joe Biden's got a head for this sort of thing, and he knows what's going on. The problem is domestic politics, which are torturous right now. And you can't show any ankle. Uh, especially with these people who come out and rail at you. And the New York Times and the Washington Post will pick up on it. They'll probably shop it, pick up on it and go with the, you know, he said this, he said that, the president looking weak and all this kind of stuff. When what they should be doing is doing their own in-depth analysis and doing some of the things I'm doing right here, right now. And, and saying, hey, look, at least half of this, if not more, and I think more, is our fault because of what we've done so ineptly and so non-strategically. But how do you back down from that? How do you get to the point, let's say we, we, we do calm the Ukraine waters and things are looking better and we come to some kind of agreement and it's based primarily on this understanding that we're not gonna put BMD launchers in Ukraine. How do we then say, uh, well, what do we do with these 29 other countries? Uh, how, how do we deal with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Montenegro, if something happens and they start it? Because that's the way these things really get out of hand is when some, some little, I'm going to say this, pipsqueak country decides that it's going to use Article 5 to cover it while it's doing something it shouldn't be doing. And the other side checks them. Um, that's how you get led into a war. You don't get led into a war usually by the bigger countries like Germany or France. You get led in by some country that feels like it's got the protection now to do things, whether it's a Hungary, a Poland, uh, one of the Baltic states or whatever. So every time you put somebody else in NATO, you increase your risk factor a little bit, little bit on that scale. Georgia really worried me that sense. Because you may recall back there in the early 2000s, that young president was standing up to the Russians in a way that you just wanted to shiver because you're looking at a map and you're thinking, now that country of 11 time zones and five to 10,000 nuclear weapons is sitting on top of you, you little pipsqueak country, and you're talking like that? I uh, would not want to bring you into NATO. I really wouldn't because you would get me into that mess just as quickly as you get yourself in. And that may sound cold and hard, but that's the reality of power, especially power at this level. You don't need to be getting yourself into places where you really have no significant interest and nuclear weapons are involved. You just don't. Um, big arguments right now over Taiwan with that respect. 24 million people who basically are in a democracy with a billion four over the top of them, armed to the teeth and wanting them. And we're standing in the way, so to speak. Um, is that really, it, it, it certainly is very good for those 24 million people. But is that really in the interest of the American people to risk nuclear war in a circumstance like that? Well, that's going to be a question we're going to have to answer in the next decade, probably, because Xi Jinping has made it quite clear that Taiwan is going to come back into China during his premiership. That's deadly. That's deadly, especially if we're still talking about the things we've been talking about for the last 50, 60 years. That's actually right now at this moment, a more dangerous area than Ukraine, Taiwan. Um, a war with China would really be a deal breaker. I've done the war gaming. 
what happens in every war game is we attrit their air force, we attrit their Navy. They take our air force and Navy down considerably. We're sitting there looking at each other with blood in the water, so to speak, and blood in the air. And we can't influence one another. My Marines called it in one war game, they called it the shark and the, and the elephant. We were the shark and we wouldn't come ashore. Remember the Princess Bride? Never start a land war in Asia. <laughs> Any, anybody would be crazy to think they could mount an invasion of China. And they can't go to sea because their Navy's pretty much crippled. Their Air Force has been shot up. So we're sitting there looking at one another and the suggestion in every war game I've ever played is on the US side, Let's hit a few of their cities along the coast with nuclear weapons. And then the, the civilian who's usually playing the president in the war game will look at the military people and say, are you kidding me? What do you think they're going to do back to us? We'll start a, new, a strategic exchange. And by the way, they've got lots more people to lose than we do. Mao Zedong once said, you hit us, we'll lose 100 million people. We'll hit you and you'll lose Los Angeles, Houston, New York, and Dallas. How do you feel about that? Mao was pretty straightforward about it. Um, and, but that's the reality of it. So Taiwan's a very dangerous place right now in terms of what might happen. I think even more dangerous than Ukraine. Um, I'll stop there and, and take questions. I've wandered all over the place. But... Colonel Wilkerson, thank you. And uh, you complimented somebody as a supreme uh, strategist or strategist par excellence during your talk. And I think you are such a person. <laughs> that was really outstanding in terms of your insights and uh, how you pulled it all together and showed the interconnections with everything. Uh, let's show Colonel Wilkerson our appreciation. I'll tell you something. Um, now, I'll tell you something. Uh, it was about a year after I'd been working for Powell, and uh, he said, "You know why I hired you, don't you?" And I said, uh, well, uh, you, you can, I think I do, but you can tell me what you think. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, I'm a good tactician, but you're a good strategist. And I, I, I said, well, I know you're a good tactician because all New Yorkers are, because all <laughs> New Yorkers know to be on the lookout for the next corner where the guy with the shiv will be out there and try and stick it in your side and take your wallet. <laughs> yes. But, but, he, but he was, he was a very good tactician. Well, we do have a number of good questions in, in the chat box, but before I get to those, I want to just interject a few announcements uh, and keep posting more. We'll see how many of the questions we can get to in the time we have left. First of all, I wanted to mention that uh, we have begun our annual membership drive for the Coalition for Peace Action. It's an annual membership. And so Patricia has uh, posted the link for uh, joining or renewing. If you haven't yet done that for your 2022 membership, we would welcome that. We're happy to do these events as free events, but we also would be happy if you can support our ongoing work uh, financially. So uh, please take a look at that. Uh, and uh, then just a few upcoming events that I hope you'll put on your calendar. We've been so busy, we don't yet have these on our website, but we expect to early this week. We're going to be uh, in coordination with National Peace Action and other groups having a Love to Afghanistan Valentine's Vigil on Monday, February 14th from five to six at Palmer Square. Uh, we hope you can join us for that. Uh, the people of Afghanistan are on the verge of massive uh, starvation and suffering, including one million children under five in danger of starving to death. So we need to move quickly in terms of getting the financial resources uh, lifted so that we can address those needs urgently. And then uh, there's going to be a voting webinar on voting issues here in New Jersey uh, on February 27th, also a Sunday afternoon. We hope you'll mark your calendar and, and plan to join us for that. And then the last one is that uh, the first Sunday of April, I think that's April 7th, uh, we have been very fortunate to get somebody who the New York Times recently called the Dean of Retired Diplomats in the United States. And that is 
Ambassador Thomas Pickering will be addressing our membership renewal gathering. So I hope you'll also mark that on your calendar and more information will be on our website shortly. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to go through some of these sort of in the order in which they came in, Colonel Wilkerson. Uh, the first one is sort of a thought and maybe you have a reaction to it. Uh, this uh, person says it's, the situation today is eerily similar to the end of World War I when the failure of the Treaty of Versailles uh, eventually led to World War II. We seem to never learn, but now we have nuclear weapons. The similarity he says that he's referring to is compared to the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union. Would you like to comment on that thought? Well, that's not altogether an um, imperfect analogy. Uh, I think the circumstances are a little bit different, if not a lot different, in terms of uh, the volatility. That is to say, the reparations on Germany alone would have probably produced what they wouldn't necessarily have produced Hitler, but they probably would have produced a lot of turmoil, if not a war. Uh, they're just the, the, I can't overemphasize how detrimental that was to the Weimar Republic's success. That plus the fear of communism, which Hitler exploited to the maximum. The Red Scare was what you know what it, what really coalesced Germans around that movement. This the the sort of nationalistic, hedonistic uh, Nazi party. And it also was what allowed him to defeat the Browns, who were part of his coalition, if you will, in the beginning. But he saw them becoming a threat to his Nazis, so he, he got rid of them, too. And it also caused the what I would call the old Prussian aristocracy and those associated with it to think, quite wrongly, as it turned out, that they could handle Hitler at any point in time. 38, 39, 40, they could handle him and they'd get rid of him. But in the meantime, they'd use him to do the things they wanted to do to sort of, quote, clean up Germany, unquote. And it got out of hand and it got out of hand primarily. And, uh, you know, the historian, I say historian, he's a, a history fiction writer, Alan First. I'm sure some of your audience, well, audience has read him. He's brilliant. He's a better historian than most historians. Um, but one of the things he suggests and others have too, is that um, what they saw was the initial victories, the Wehrmacht victories. And of course, a lot of these people were either of the Wehrmacht or associated with the Wehrmacht because they were Prussians and that's Germany. And so when the victories came so easily, they began to get caught up in the euphoria as military people will do um, and realized that uh, Hitler was on to something that maybe they could be the new Napoleon of Europe, you know, and take half of Europe, if not more. Um, and then I, I think this is something that historians have, haven't looked at closely enough. Then when he went to the final solution meeting and that began to leak a little bit and people knew what he was doing or planned to do to Europe's Jews, um, it sort of soured with some and some picked up and left. Uh, in order to get out of there. And they weren't necessarily all Jews either. Um, but some stayed because that resonated with it. And the Germans don't like to admit this, but that resonated with a number of Germans too. And so you had these forces that aren't prevalent today, I hope, that moved things along um, that I don't think we have today. Now, we do have some pressures like those, though, which the gentleman's question intimates. And they are the fact, for example, I just said, Putin has no cards in his deck. The Russian economy is, is just not there. The only thing they got is Gazprom and, and the oil and other things that go along with that. They are so bad at polluting their environment and polluting the environment in particular where the wells are and such and the pipelines that I shudder to think what they're going to be like in 10 years or 15 years, unless someone comes in with management expertise. You know, they got rid of Citizen K, <laughs> the guy who really was aware of all of this. They put him in jail. Uh, he was a crook, too, of course. All the oligarchs are crooks. But 
Um, he was at least aware of what you had to do to run a modern refinery, to run a modern pipeline, to extract oil in a modern, ecologically sound way, if there's any such truth to that. Anybody extracting oil in my mind now is contributing to an ultimate existential crisis. But at least they were clean. He was cleaner about doing it. They don't have anybody like that now. And so there is that pressure that Putin is doing what he's doing because it's the only way he can survive politically, domestically. He right. has to keep sticking his fingers in Washington's face. And he, does, he doesn't have anything to entice the Russian people with economically. Um, and so that's how he survives. That's how he keeps his, uh, such as they are, they're going down. But that's how he keeps his poll numbers up. Um, it's a dangerous time, but I think it's a little bit different from from that period. Right. Thanks so much. Uh, this is another uh, sophisticated question, like the one you just answered. Secretary Blinken's words on CNN about Russia and Ukraine apply to the U.S. embargo of Cuba. What's at stake here are some very basic principles of international relations, a principle like the fact that you cannot now in the 21st century purport to exert a sphere of influence to try to subjugate your neighbors to your will. Is it conceivable that the off ramp here is for both big countries to stop intervention in their smaller neighbors and to pledge not to use the other's neighbor for strategic advantage? Here, here. <laughs> all right. That was, I'm all for a, that. I just, I just was a, I just attended a webinar last week on 60 years of the blockade. That's what the Cubans call it, the blockade. 60 years, and and the last few months have been truly lamentable. They are the only country in the world that we actively tried to keep from getting COVID-19 paraphernalia. Actively tried to keep them from getting it. Masks ventilators, you name it. We, we actually tried to kill Cubans through COVID-19. Um, I agree with the gentleman 100%. We all ought to swear an oath to that. Great, thank you. Well, here's another question. How do we enforce agreements such as the Budapest Accords where Ukraine gave up the Soviet era nuclear weapons in exchange for guarantees of its independence and territorial integrity? Would it be useful for someone like former Chancellor Angela Merkel to act as a mediator? I certainly wouldn't object to that. I think she's a very talented woman. And if she would take on the role, it'd be a very difficult role, complex role. And I think she's a little weary, a little tired. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be opposed to it. And I think that's, that's a way to approach it, too, that would be um, hard for people to not deal with. When you when you start laying the, the cards on the table, um, I I'm I have been somewhat appalled at how agreements just fall by the wayside. The one that really struck me as being uh, just no common sense to it at all, just stupidity all around every side, was this business of and and my party did it. My political party, the Republicans, did it in this country tried to obliterate by getting even Jim Baker to come back and reconsider what he had said earlier, and he can reconsider all day long. I know what he said. Um, what was done with regard to the reunification of NATO. We told Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, Baker's, Baker's counterpart, we told them that if they agreed, Gorbachev agreed, to the reunification of Germany and its retention in NATO, the alliance would come not one inch further east. Those were the exact words. Um, and you can back off it all you want to. And, you know, Republicans have actually said, well, uh, uh, verbal agreements don't mean anything. Are you kidding me? Verbal agreements are part of the history of diplomacy. And gentlemen don't violate them. And ladies don't violate them. Um, but it's amazing how many people have said, uh, no, that's not relevant anymore. What's relevant is American power. And what's relevant is threats to American power. And this is a threat to American power. And we can lie, cheat, and steal to beat this. Another, uh, thank you. Another question is in the area of injecting the topic of nuclear disarmament 
into the talks with Putin. I know there is some of that has already been done in terms of possibly reinvigorating the INF treaty, but could you comment on that area? Very necessary thing to do. Um, I hope the gentleman's question implies this. I hope it's right that this will be some momentum for other things. Um, all we have now is new start. And right. even that in this in Ukraine imbroglio um, looks like it could be a tool to wave around and we don't need to be waving around any more nuclear arms treaties. We just about destroyed all nuclear arms weapons control. It's just, I don't know why we would want to do that, except the military industrial complex has a little niche in there called the nuclear weapons complex, which makes tons of money off this, not just the weapons themselves, but also the wastage. They make money off getting rid of nuclear waste. So it's a, it's a real gravy train and they have certain New Mexico and other congressmen and senators who are involved in it. And it's a niche industry, but it's very lucrative, very lucrative. Um, and that's a problem. They don't want to see nuclear weapons being curbed anymore because that cuts into their budget. But that, that's a very good suggestion and a, and, a, and a good proposal. Thank you. Another uh, question is about China's possible role. Is there anything China could do to help de-escalate, assuming that China would be interested in playing such a role? Of course, what they're doing right now is joining Vladimir Putin and essentially giving him a little more moxie when he makes remarks because we are allied and here we are and we're doing ocean exercises together with our navies and we're getting ready to do a little exercise with our land forces and so forth. Um, I think Xi Jinping is of a mind that uh, we are unsalvageable. Uh, and again, there's a lot of blame accruing to us for his arriving at that decision, but I don't discount his arrogance either. Um, if you listen to his 19th party Congress remarks, this is a man who is very different from Hu Jintao, whom I knew a little bit. Um, this man is intent on the history books recording him almost the way Mao Zedong was. Um, but with Xi Jinping, it's not externally. Mao is not really interested in going abroad. You know, he, he restricted China's nuclear weapons by saying, these are stupid weapons and anybody that used them is stupid. We don't need any, they're too expensive, but we'll have a few just to deter those idiots out there. That was Mao's view. Now the Chinese are revisiting that. I think they have in their central party school made a strategic decision to build out very fast now, modernized, and be able to absorb a first strike and respond. They never could do that before because all they wanted to do is deter. They, they only have about 200, 300 weapons. And think about that when we had 30,000 and the Soviets had 30,000. Um, so now they're going to start building, I think. So Xi scares me much more than any previous Chinese leader. Great. Thank you. So another question is, is there a face-saving way for Putin to bring his troops home from the Ukrainian border? Well, this is an interesting proposition. <laughs> I was talking with a general officer, the other army general, um, and I said, well, what do you think um, if we put a few more troops on our southern border, Mexico ought to say? Because those troops are in Russia. They're not in Ukraine or they're in Belarusia, who is a CSR par partner with Russia. So he has every right to have those troops there. <laughs> Yeah, you could say, oh, that's threatening, that's threatening. Well, Mexico could tell us that it's threatening to have all those National Guard troops on our southern border too. And from time to time, even more than National Guard. I'm, I'm not being facetious necessarily. I, I, I'm saying that he has every right to have those troops there. Um, man, people like one person on the interview I did uh, about a week ago said, well, that's the same thing Hitler did. He put the troops there and you know, I said, yeah, but Hitler was putting people in the other countries to make insolence so that the troops could then come in. And start. Well, the Putin's doing that too. And I asked him, I said, how do you know that? How do you know that that's not the Ukrainians doing that? And I said, well, I'll answer my own question. It's not the Ukrainians doing it now because they're shivering in their boots about the potential for their country being a new Syria. <laughs> and, I mean, I've had a number of them tell me that in emails. Yeah, don't don't listen to the leadership or whatever. 
we do not want this country to fall apart and people be killing each other in the streets. And so we've seen that. We know what that's like. So they may look like they're brave and so forth and sitting on the border and all that. And I'm sure they are, but they do not want their country to be ripped apart with this internecine warfare like we're seeing in other places. A million people, you, you made the announcement just now about the children. I'm told a million people have crossed the Afghan border in the last six weeks and are now new refugees. We have 175 million refugees in the world now. The, and many of them are from these wars. These are people without homes, no future, no possibility for an education for their children. Uh, we're just murdering people when we do this. So we don't wanna start this in Central Europe. Thank you. Does the United Nations have a possible role in this process of diplomacy? Is Ukraine going to be receptive to such a process? You know, to this point, the United Nations has been pretty, um, uh, it's been too much on our side, in my view. Um, and, and it needs to stop that. And it needs to get, you know, that's easy for me to say, but it, it needs to be a little bit more uh, ecumenical in its approach. It needs to be a little more balanced in its approach, particularly when we do things like we just did, bring them, everybody together in the Security Council and start upbraiding the Russians for what they're doing. And, um, it's The U UN has turned into a debating society that normally does, people rail at the UN and my political party and I look at them and I say, do you know the UN is us? The UN does what we want them to do about 80% of the time. And the other 20% is usually factless. They do what we want them to do because guess who pays most of their money? And guess whose country their building is in? And guess whose country they have to live in and survive in? They do what we want them to do. And we chastise them when we put them to doing something that we know the world's gonna criticize. We then put the criticism on the UN and vice versa when it's something that we think is gonna be of a claim. But they have been too much that way of late. They need to be more independent and they need to be more of what the designers wanted them to be. That's, Thank I think they could be helpful. Uh, yes, I remember I too, yes. I remember a tremendous diplomat from Brazil by the name of Sergio Vieira de May. And I remember he spoke five languages, as I recall, handsome, tall guy, typical Brazilian, um, just fearless. He walked into a Khmer Rouge camp when no one else would even go in and talk to them. He walked into the camp and walked into the main headquarters building and began a dialogue with the head of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. <laughs> he went in and did the same thing in East Timor. Uh, when the ruckus was going on there that was killing people and the Indonesians were getting ready to invade. Um, great, he was killed in Iraq. Why was he killed? He was killed because he represented the UN in Iraq and we didn't like him and Jerry Bremer wouldn't talk to him and we didn't put any kind of quick reaction team around his building and they blew it up. Why did Al Qaeda blow that building up? Because they knew that that man was the most effective man in Iraq and they wanted to get rid of him and they got rid of him. And what did he do from the rubble? For hours, he talked on his cell phone in the rubble asking, did everyone get out? Is everyone, that was Sergio. That's the kind of person he was. We need more diplomats like that. And let me tell you, Tony Blinken is not Sergio Vieira de Mello. Thank you. I, uh, here's a question from a fellow veteran of the military. What role does the international oligarchy play in all this? If the world is fractured into thousands of little pieces, doesn't that leave the banks and the corporations firmly in charge and most of the people enslaved? Uh, I just nod my head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that? did you see it in one thing, one service, the, I think it was the New York Times, maybe it was the Washington Post, did recently was they published those uh, transcripts of the uh, overheard executives of Lockheed Martin, Grumman, Boeing, uh, Raytheon, I think. They were talking about their, they, they were talking about their publicity campaign to their investors 
and they were they were putting this out that oh look at Ukraine look we're going to have a big one well, our share price is going to go sky through the sky you need to invest that's what we're talking about we're talking about making war so profitable that we have more of it thank you uh just two last questions then uh you have given joe biden some good marks please comment on those close to him i think jake sullivan's a little young um he's been playing a national security advisor the way he should though he's not out in front and doing all kinds of things and making himself seem to be the president rather than biden which you would think would be somewhat easier for him because of biden's age um but he's not doing that so that's a compliment to him but i don't see a lot of positive things that he's doing but i maybe that's because he's not that public Blinken, on the other hand, uh, I, I was I was really hoping that Blinken would be a different kind of Secretary of State because I'd seen Pompeo up close and personal. Pompeo was just tragic for American yes. foreign policy. Yes. Um, I mean, we're still suffering for thing from things he did. I don't. Yes. I don't think Blinken has been that different, though. He's just been softer and a little easier and a little less willing to confront and a little less arrogant. But I don't think he's been that different. And one place I'll really go too fast to sort of corroborate that is the Iran agreement. I think we're right on the brink right now of losing it, losing the whole thing. Um, and part of that, I think, is because of the hard headedness of the American negotiating team. I won't take anything away from the Iranians. They're hard headed too, but it's our place to be the mea culpa. What can we do to help? Exactly. Here? You know, because we departed a, an approved agreement. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I, if I were the Iranians, I would be looking at the elections in 2024 and I'd be asking myself, how long is this one going to last? Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, so here's a last question then. Uh, nuclear weapons are a very large niche. We spent some seven trillion dollars on nukes since we started. We need that money to solve the existential crises of climate and of new pandemics. I guess that's not a question but more of a statement. Um, and then another one I'll throw in as well, will the Ukraine and Taiwan crises tend to increase reliance on nuclear weapons or reduce them? So you got a, a lot there to comment on if you'd like to. <laughs> well, the first one I would agree with, and, and I had every hope that the nuclear posture review that President Biden was conducting was going to cut back significantly. Uh, but he's absolutely right. We do not need to be spending this money, which could be much better spent. You know what our infrastructure plan is now? to let the bridges like the one in Pennsylvania collapse and then we'll fix them. That seems to be what it is, you know. Okay, we'll fix the infrastructure when it falls apart and kills people. Um, we need to do these things and we're stealing money from that for these nuclear weapons, dangerous in, in addition to being stupid. Um, I hope what we get out of this ultimately, and I was hoping this for the Iran talks too, and with Korea, same thing is more serious diplomatic palaver, talk, discussions on just where we are right now with nuclear weapons, because it's shaping up to be as existential as the climate crisis. The, the, this business of building more, more states, um, we need, for example, to tell Israel, become a member of the non-proliferation treaty tomorrow morning or you are finished with us. We need to be really harsh with Israel about that. And then we need to start talking about how maybe this idea of a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East makes sense. And oh, by the way, that means uh, you've got to gradually get your get rid of yours, Jerusalem. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but it is possible to start the diplomacy to, to move towards it. Who thought that we would be inside Russia in what we started in 92 or 93 and and we're still there a decade later destroying their nuclear weapons yeah but we were who thought we'd be in the mediterranean with our crack army uh, chemical weapons team 
destroying Saddam, uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad's chemical weapon stocks. Um, those things can be done if cooler heads prevail and the right diplomacy is conducted. And those are the kinds of things we need to be doing because we got some big challenges ahead. And they're going to threaten the presence of humans on this planet. And the planet doesn't care. It will cast us off just like it did the dinosaurs and go right on 4 billion more years until it burns out in the sun. We'll be gone. Maybe we ought to raise up a dinosaur or two and talk to them about it. <laughs> That's an interesting suggestion as we close. And thank you so much. Those issues that you mentioned just now are exactly the ones that we're working hard on and need to continue and accelerate our work on. Thank you so much, Good. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, for an excellent for talk and an excellent Q&A period as well. And just one last reminder to uh, go to peacecoalition.org and in the upper right-hand corner, if you haven't yet joined or renewed your 2022 membership, this would be a great time to do it. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, for joining us. Thanks again to Colonel Welferson. And we hope that you all have a rest, uh, wonderful rest of your day and uh, peace to all of you. I like that. Peace be with you too. Thank you so much, Colonel. Take care. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody.